afternoon, everybody. Is it working? Can you yeah, hear me? Is. Hello. Yes, I can hear myself. That's good. Uh, afternoon. Thanks for coming along to what I'm sure will be a wonderful session with Badisha. We're talking about her new book, Asylum and Exile, which um, is full of amazing stories. You couldn't really have a more topical book um, when we still... I, I think today the big news story is people continually drowning, dying in their desperate attempt to reach Europe. And of course, you know, these are very newsworthy events commented on hugely and reacted to in the media ad infinitum. But I think probably many people don't really know the issues behind. Um, we, the stories behind the issues, actually, the stories of real individual human beings like you or me who have the same kind of desires um, and wishes to lead a good life. Uh, so it's a profoundly moving book, and as I say, it's a very timely book. Um, so I'd like to start, um, Bidisha, by uh, pointing out that it was through the good offices of Penn, wasn't yes, it, it was. that you got this, this gig? that led to the book. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, it was amazing. It's part of English Pen's outreach program. And so they sent me to various migrants research centers. One was called Praxis in West London, and the other one was called the Migrants Resource Center in mm. Victoria. And it was to do the most basic kind of literary outreach, which is that you do literary workshops, reading, writing, composition, with people who are traditionally the hardest to reach, asylum seekers, refugees, undocumented migrants, undocumented minors. Mm. So it was me and a group of these strangers in severely under-resourced charity rooms. We didn't have heating. Uh, halfway mm. through, someone would come in with a trolley of tea and there'd be this rush to get the tea and the cakes. And somehow across the months, we built up incredible trust and I was trying to get people to do any to do writing. I'm not sure I taught my students anything. And as any teacher will say, they taught me much more than I could teach them. But they were so full of stories. And these stories came out in between our writing exercises. So I walked in. And on the first day, I said, hello, I'm from English Pen. I'm from a charity. And then suddenly, one of the guys on my left said, oh, you're from a charity? Give us some money then. And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not from that kind of charity. I'm from a literary charity. And they were like, D I think it's fair to say quite a lot of the people weren't necessarily there for your amazing um, help, wit, wisdom, and all of that. And um, indeed, they, they got none. <laughs> no help, no wit, no wisdom. We were doing little bits of writing, but somehow in the odd moments, you know, when we were taking a break, suddenly they would start confiding in me. And mm. we were doing very simple exercises. And I said, look, write me something about your sense of home. And suddenly, uh, a man named Claude, who's from the Democratic Republic of Congo, said, what do you mean home? I have no home. I'm a traveling man. I'm in limbo. I, I'm like a yo-yo. I've been mm. here for 11 years. Because these were asylum seekers who hadn't been granted refugee status. And their limbo would last years and years and years. And all of them were working in the gray or the black market, working off the books, coming into places like this at 3 o'clock in the morning to clean it. Uh, one of my favorite students was a guy called Manny, and he was Iranian. And he was from Tehran. He used to be a professor in classical Persian music at the University of Tehran. He was forcibly conscripted. He fled at the time when, in fact, this is still happening, lots of intellectuals and creatives were being persecuted. He came up through Europe, he came to England, and he now works in a sandwich factory for two pounds an hour, gets ill every other day because you work in the freezer room and the, the freezers are sort of blowing down on your head. And I looked at him and I thought, my God, you should never take anything for granted whatsoever. I now know exactly how sandwiches get into packets. They're put mm. there by a famous Iranian composer. Mm. <laughs> and despite all of this, he and everybody else was just so full of humor. You know, he was saying to me, oh, my name's Manny, Manu Cher. It means the face of paradise. And, you know, I know this is a little bit disappointing, but, you know, perhaps when I was younger, you were... <laughs> 
you would have understood why I was called Nanu Chair. And this is what happened all the time. They teased each other, they teased me. And um, these people are exactly the ones who are the least heard and the most silenced and the most vilified. And it bothered me. And just naturally as a journalist, I began writing down mm. everything because it was just so interesting. It was so nuanced and humane. And I asked their permission. I said, look, I can't promise anything, but the things you're telling me, can I just put them in a book? But um, I think you said earlier on that your first thought was to do a piece of journalism. And that didn't get off the ground. And that rather intrigued me because these are, these are great stories. So what, what happened with that? I think something very interesting but frustrating happens when it comes to short journalism mm. about these sorts of issues. So on the one hand, you have the terrible stuff. Uh, you open a tabloid and it's about uh, asylum, asylum seekers and illegal immigrants and migrants and who, whoever, you know, all of these things are sort of conflated into mm. each other and they're, mm. they're very different things. And uh, organized crime and gangs and it's all about vilifying people who are different and it's about selling the idea that England is full and it can't take any more people and that hundreds of people are turning up every day and they're going to swamp you and dilute you and do these terrible things. So that's the vilification. Mm. And the media does it, and politicians do it, particularly, you know, UKIP, but not even that, you know, even the Tory party do it. Mm. And then left politicians sort of kowtow and allow themselves to be drawn towards the right, and they say things like, oh, well, we understand people are worried about immigration, mm. and we can come on to that later, but that's one side. The other side is bodies in boats. Dead people, babies, women, children, dying in boats. Very sad, tragic, and the media loves these stories. Mm. You know, whenever 500 new people die in a boat, you have a huge picture. But even though those articles are themselves very sympathetic, the people are not individualized. They're not humanized. They're not given a name. No one asks, okay, where are these people from? What did they do? These are human beings who mm. are educated, they've got jobs, they're leaving extreme poverty, war, fragile states, a variety of factors. And so I was bothered by that too. I don't like these articles which are just designed to make you cry without looking into the deeper nuances and without humanizing and individualizing people. And when I met my crazy students, each one was such an individual that I thought, I've got to do, there's a book in this, I've got to bring each of these characters out. And there are, in fact, so many that I, I can't think of specific examples because there were so many. But I'm thinking of my, one of my favorites, this Cameroonian woman, uh, and I call her Banina in the novel, but she had the most beautiful real name. Her, her name was Tua Fese Fese, which is so lovely, and it means uh, nothing can stand in my way. That's mm. what the name means. And she was always like, like this, but she didn't have headphones on. She was dancing to this sort of internal music and she just glowed. And I thought, God, you're so fantastic. And then, of course, I found out that she had got here. She had managed to get a sort of NVQ in management and she joined a small company and she worked up, worked her way up. And yes, it's true that she was here illegally. It's true that some tiny detail of her application or of her job status wasn't legal, but she was desperate to work. She paid all her taxes. I mean, what's, what's the problem here? Someone in her company dobbed her into the police. The police turn up at her office. They drag her out in front of everybody. They say, you're an illegal immigrant. They throw her in prison. They hold her there for three days. They don't let her wash or shower or anything. She was on her period at the time, and they start making comments saying that she smells, but they still won't let her wash. And eventually, mm. she shamed them. She said, you've got daughters, you've got sisters, you've got mothers, you've got wives. Would you treat them like this? And she shamed them after three days into letting her take a shower. And uh, it, all of that really bothers me. That's typical of the kinds of stories I learned. And despite that, though, there was this incredible drive to survive. You know, these people move onwards. There's no time to be self-reflexive or to have any angst. You just keep going on. You try and regularize your life. Did you ever think, um, in a slightly different form of writing, this could be a novel? You know, you look at Chris question. Cleave's novel, uh, The 
can't remember what it's called, but the char character's called Little B, and that is a very, very powerful novel. I mean, that is a powerful way of getting these ideas across too. Did that cross your mind at all? That's a fantastic question. Uh, so to give background just to audience members who don't know, it's true that I published two novels very early. So the first came out when I was 18 and the second when I was 21. Uh, and I do read fiction all the time. I, I, and I, indeed I am planning on going back to it. But no, I think that if you cut me through, there's journalist is written all the way through like a stick of rock. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It didn't occur to me. And mm -hmm. I don't like to do that. I don't like to meet someone and hear their story and then somehow absorb it and cannibalize it and change a few details and then regurgitate it and say, oh, this is a little story for you to read. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that there are novelists who do that with real integrity and authenticity, mm -hmm. but I would feel absolutely wrong about doing it. I see myself as a human rights journalist and Part of what I like about that identity is that it's very porous. So I meet someone and then it just translates itself onto the page as is. Mm. Not that I don't give analysis and, and go into my experiences, but I want it to be as true to people as possible. And instead of talking all over it myself, I wanted their voices and the rhythms of their voices to come out completely. The most I've done when I give excerpts of other people's speech is I, I change their name for legal reasons, for reasons of discretion. I don't want the police finding them and throwing them into a detention center because I wrote a book about them. Mm. Uh, so it's a fantastic question. In fact, I hadn't even thought about putting them into fiction. I think that if, if I was a true novelist, which I'm not, um, I would have been able to, but I'm a, a, tr a true journalist, I think. I think you can do it with integrity. Um, but I also love what you've done in your book, because actually quite a bit of you comes out as well. There's a lot of dialogue, it seems to me, going on. Um, sometimes almost like a play form where you're trying to work out what on earth it is that you can give them <laughs> that will be of any use at all. And I think it's fair to say the whole assignment was not what you expected. I mean, how quickly did you wise up to, like, Everything I planned is not going to work in this situation. Within, within about 10 minutes, I mm. realized that my classroom plans are going to be wasted. I had my little, you know, you go with your little bag of sort of whiteboard pens. Mm. Yeah, they, they, they were never used. We didn't do anything about that. Because the, my students' personalities were so much stronger than mine. Mm. And what they had to tell me was so much stronger than what I had to tell them that... I realized, too, uh, that th there was a sort of mystery about what was drawing my students back to the class. These were all people who are educated up to the age of 18 at the very least. Mm. All of them spoke English, some to varying degrees. Everyone spoke at least three or four languages. So learning an extra one on top, learning English on top is not difficult. So it's not like anyone needed help with English. And day, week after week, I'd look out and go, what is it that keeps us coming here and I, I think that it's something that went well beyond the written language that somehow we were creating a kind of humane energy mm. between ourselves we had a kind of chemistry as a group and I also get the feeling that a lot of the stories that I was hearing it's something that every single student while their experiences were quite common did, didn't really verbalize because there's one stage at which, uh, and again, this is the dark humor of the asylum process. My students were competing with each other to see who had had the worst experience in a detention center. And someone was going, oh, I've been at Dover. They were like old timers. Yeah, I've been at Dover. And someone said, oh, have you been to Camsfield Park? That's the really bad one. Have you had to wear a tag? Did you go from prison to detention or detention to prison? And so on and so forth. Um, and I don't think that anyone had really externalized what had happened to them until that point. And there were divisions in the class. So it was an extremely varied group of people from, let's say, 12, 13 different countries, African countries, Middle Eastern countries, you name it. And there was a group of people in the corner who I nicknamed the Shady Guys because I am convinced that they had been in some kind of militia. They didn't know each other but they got incredibly excited whenever we talked about war or violence. One of them wrote a very vivid uh, piece of writing about what it's like living in a barracks. And he said, people think it's just soldiers. There are schools in army barracks. There are churches in army barracks. 
And when he began talking, suddenly a woman shouted from the other side of the room, oh yeah, you, you love the army, do you? You think that's fantastic. Do you want to join the Congolese army? What do you think that's like? Uh, another woman from Sierra Leone, again, a very, very jovial woman who was always laughing in class. Uh, I found a piece of writing that she'd put in the back of her exercise book. And it was a letter to her daughter. And it said, dear daughter, um, I'm writing to you. Please, can you ask your dad to take me back into the family home? Because um, during the conflict in our country, I was raped by the rebels. And when your dad found out, he kicked me out. And I just want you to know, dear daughter, that I'm here. And can you please speak to him? And another woman who is from a different country, not Sierra Leone, said, you know, please believe me, we're not lying, we're not lying. If we go back to our countries, they're, gonna, they're going to rape us and kill us and steal everything and destroy our homes. We're not lying at all. Uh, and all of this sort of bubbled up. And yet it wasn't tragic. That's the funny thing about mm. it. It was a completely positive, life-affirming experience. Every single one of those people was desperate to work and contribute because, of course, Work isn't just a way of getting money, it's a way of being part of the world. It's a way mm. of feeling that you are part of a network. You, have, you meet people from different backgrounds, you have a name and a face. Uh, so there was a tremendous sense of uh, human wastage, wastage of potential. It seems glib to say it, but did some of them really need someone to sit and listen? Did you find yourself thinking, the best thing I can do is not, you know, sort of, teach them declensions or whatever, um, but just by witnessing, by listening, validate the story, what they're trying to say. I think there is something in that. I, I mean, I should put in some sort of big disclaimer at the beginning because this, is, this conversation is making me look um, good and it's a very flattering conversation. I was, I'm not particularly good at outreach work. I'm not mm. a particularly good teacher. I'm not a particularly good listener or, or any <laughs> of those things. Uh, and, and I think all my students will agree with me when, when I say that, although I still do outreach work and I work with trafficked women and, uh, and all of this other stuff. I think it's that I met my students at the time when they were ready to talk. And the best one was the woman I've dedicated the book to, a Ugandan woman called Beatrice Tibahurira, and that is her real name, and I use it mm. in the book. She was the one student who... I got the feeling she loved reading and writing over and above the fact that we were doing these workshop sessions. She came in on the first day and she had a library book of a Middle Eastern woman's autobiography. And she came up to me at the end of the class and she said, I like reading, I'll read anything. I've read things in every genre. And when we were doing a very simple exercise about what are our favorite things, everyone was saying, you know, I like my phone because it connects up the various parts of my life because my life is very chaotic. Or I like my watch because my grandchildren gave it to me. She said, uh, I love my pen. It's always in my hand and it feels like part of my hand. And when I don't have my pen with me, I feel like I've lost my hand. And she had been already working on a long, long letter to one of her children. And in that letter, she explained why she had left Uganda. Mm. And she was and is a brilliant writer. And her work was full of memories of growing up in Uganda, but also details about the reality of her life here. And she, she wrote this incredible poem called This Is Not What I Am. And she described some of her experiences over here. For example, when she was first in England, someone asked her if she knew how to turn on a light switch. And she would come out of the toilet and someone would say, have you washed your hands? They assumed that she didn't know how to read or write. This is a, this is a woman in her 50s who used to teach accounting in a college, for God's sake. And in this poem, she said, no, that is not what I am. I've read Shakespeare. I've done science experiments. I've sung in the choir at the Barbican. You know, this beautiful measured tone that she had. And so I said to her, if you begin your letter to your son telling your life story, I will put it into the book. And so I interwove mm. some of her longer pieces. And as I hope is obvious, she, she's a real writer. And it bothers me in a wonderful industry event like this. I know that Beatrice is never going to get the agent 
the book deal, the publishing stardom, because she's, she's not in the network of people. I, I have never seen her since. I still teach in the room mm. that I did those lessons in. I was there yesterday. And uh, I haven't seen her since, and that was three years ago. Although there's a positive spin on that, which is that if you don't see these people again, it means they're getting on with their lives. And I really like that. I'm in favor of that. If you're still taking outreach three or four years on, yeah. it means that your life is stalled. Mm. Uh, but they're all, they're all doing something wonderful, I, I have no doubt. Just going to check my watch. I think we have to have questions now, actually. Um, it goes by so quickly. I'm sure some... People in the audience will have questions for you. Uh, we've got a roving mic. Yes, we have, there we go. Um, does anybody have a question about her experiences with asylum seekers? Don't be shy. Has anybody got a question? I'm happy I can to answer more of yours. You're I can a, throw a you another one, actually, because I wanted to ask you... You're a fantastic um, chair. If um, I'm not. <laughs> I'm about as good a chair as you are, a teacher of English, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, did you have to be sensitive about certain topics? Uh, given that people were presumably different cultures, different religions, different parts of war-torn continents and so on, were there things where you thought this could kick off if I'm not careful? There, there was amazing cohesion within the group. And actually what I noticed is that it was a completely non-fractious group. People were helping each other. People were giving each other pieces of advice. And because th these are people who are living at the edge of destitution, so surviving on four or five pounds a day, um, they would help each other about things like bus routes. Where do you, you know, which bus do you take? to get somewhere. So, no. But it's also true that the most heart-rending stories that I heard were given to me anonymously. Mm. The things about uh, sexual violence and torture, um, even one of the shady guys who I was very creeped out by described witnessing in Timbuktu a man being ritually disemboweled by uh, some other militia leader. And the, the, so this guy was disemboweled and his body and his entrails were left out as a warning to everyone else you know don't try to resist and this is again this three lines that i found in the back of the notebook so this wasn't what they were presenting that they were happy to put their name to it was sort of almost secret writing and he said you know and i felt horrified and very much traumatized uh, and he also wrote, you know, I see myself as a syndicate killer. And I'm like, ah, that's so scary. And then the second line was, and yet sometimes I also feel so vulnerable. But this is, this is the kind of thing that no one, you know, maybe a woman like Beatrice would say that to my face because this is a very secure woman who is experienced and older. But actually, all of the really crushing stuff was, it was written almost as an afterthought. And... I got the feeling also that a lot of the most traumatized people, the people who had active PTSD, would come into one or two of the classes and I actually wouldn't see them again. When you're traumatized, you have to be ready to receive help. It's not that someone says to you from the Red Cross, oh, you've got PTSD, do this, meet this bunch of strangers and a, a teacher who's a total stranger, go sit in the class and write out your pain. It just doesn't work like that. It can take years before you're ready to verbalize anything that, that, that has happened. And so the people who were, didn't even verbalize that. I just sort of found, found these pieces of paper. Months later, I had a stack of things and I just found these scraps of writing. Uh, another woman, again, anonymously said that her mother had not really survived the murder of her daughter. M many women who had been raped didn't survive it in the village. And these are, these are all fragmentary pieces of writing. And I'm reminded of that because just yesterday I was doing my class. I'm doing uh, outreach sessions with the mothers and babies group of asylum seekers and exes. So imagine giving a, uh, giving, if giving a class in a crash. You know, you're trying to do some writing and then this toddler is like biting the back of your knee and you look down and they're smiling up at you like this is the best fun ever. Um, and one of my bosses said to me, look, there's a woman from the trafficked women's group. She literally turned up this morning. She's raging PTSD, I mean, full on. No one needs me to explain what trafficking is, I, I hope. 
uh, but it's the high, one of the highest forms of torture, sexual torture, mental torture. And I met her, and she was this wonderful young woman, but absolutely silent. And you could tell there was so much intensity there. She did not speak to another woman for the entire class. I didn't expect her to do any writing. I didn't expect her to, s to speak, and I would never make her do that. But I was very conscious not to like suddenly grab her and touch her and go, oh, hey, how's it going? And she just sat there. But you could tell she was in that very raw state where you're just focused on kind of not completely falling apart. But even she, by the end of the session, we were talking about triumphs and you know little moments in life where you really want to, you set yourself a test. And one of my previous students had said she was so scared about speaking English, she, she made herself go to a library to get a library card. And she did it. And then suddenly this trafficked woman said to me, um, I can sing and I wanted to be in the choir at church and, and I did it. You know, someone had dropped out of the choir and the guy who ran the choir was looking around and she, wasn't, she, she wouldn't stand up. And then right at the end of it, she put her hand up and she managed to sing. And I said, that's fabulous. And then I said to her, you know, I'm never going to make you do this, but I, I would really like to hear your voice. You've got to sing for me at some point. No pressure. And she's like, no, no. I said, no, you must. You must. I can tell that you have a beautiful voice. But... It took a long time, and I, I, to be honest, I don't think she's going to come back. Mm. And that's the truth. I really want her to. I can't remember her name. I don't think she even told me her name. I don't think she's going to come back. For a while. Mm. You know, people come when they're ready. And you can't force that. And you can't sort of violate people for their stories because it's, cause it's but wrong. But they, they have to give their stories pretty sharpish, don't, don't they? When they arrive at uh, immigration, they've got to perform... Um, on cue and, yeah. you know, be the right sort of traumatized person. And, and even then, the they're time. not going to be believed. Mm. People who have got scars from torture are not believed. And this is a whole, this is, I mean, this is a whole separate session, the, the home office tribunals and testing. There's basically a culture of disbelief and denial. Mm. And I, I don't even believe that officials do disbelieve asylum seekers. I think they know that they're telling the truth. No one on the planet in this country or another country lies about being raped or tortured or persecuted. No one on the planet leaves everything to go to another country to take advantage of it or to cause crime or to do any of this stuff. This, these are myths. And it bothers me that there isn't a counter-narrative. You know, ordinarily, typically, it would be politicians on the mainstream left who would provide a counter-narrative to this, these lies and vilification. But, I, uh, you know, there's no votes in it. Mm. That's why. It's about money and power. There's no votes in it. Mm. No mainstream left politician has stood up to say what I'm saying or what lots of journalists who are working outside of the political system are saying. Instead, they've, ste they've kept completely quiet. It's, I mean, it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. If any, you know... I've been to Dover Detention Center, and I can tell you that there are more rolls of barbed wire outside a detention center than there are outside a, a domestic prison, because I also work in prisons. Mm. It's te they're terrifying places. I, can't, I don't have language to explain how, how frightening they are, and indeed, I, I didn't put it into the book because I began going after I finished writing the book. Maybe it'll be the topic for another, another book. Uh, and I'm they're very suspicious. They, they don't want do-gooders in there. Yeah. So I would love to get in, but I, I don't know if that'll happen. We did another talk a few weeks ago, and I ended by saying that I think really we should have a Baroness Badisha in the House of Lords raising all these issues and holding politicians to account, and I still think that's an excellent idea. If anyone's listening, if the powers that be are listening, I don't mean the NSA, I mean the, <laughs> the other powers that be. Um, I wouldn't mind. I'd just like to finish by saying it's, it's a really, really enjoyable, powerful and moving book. And just as Badisha says, it's not sort of uh, read it, weep, and then don't really think about it again. I mean, I mean, it really does leave you with a very powerful sense of uplift and that something can be done, something should be done. Uh, it's a terrific book and you're brilliant to have written it and to do the work that you do. Thanks very much, Badisha. Thank you Thanks very much. For Thanks coming. for asking such great questions. Thanks to you as well.